kids across the city, it should be put on hold. More needs to be done because it's a huge task here. Government's efforts towards education for all. Whether these schools are providing quality education or not. And inadequacy of the RTE. No. Um, I think that there are, there are the education system, 90% of our jobs need skills and 90% of our kids come out with bookish knowledge. And so that's in the people who receive skills. But So 58% of India's kids suffer from some kind of skill deprivation. Some may be last mile unemployability, which is zero to six months of repair. Um, some may be interventional unemployability, which is six months to one year of repair. And there are a lot of kids who just are structurally unemployable. They need to go back to prepare because repair is just not. We can't teach somebody in six months what they should have learned in 15 years. So it is clear that both our vocational training system and our primary school system and our college system is not producing employable children. See, I think the Educa skill reform is very different from education reform. In education reform, you can, it's very hard to measure outcomes. In skill reform, the outcome is binary. It either led to a job or didn't lead to a job. So we have to think about vocational training as much easier to measure outcomes. And we should stop paying for training, um, 200 hours of training the government, or we should pay for jobs. Which is why the innovation lies at the intersection of employment and employability. So we need to reform the Apprenticeship Act. The Stupid Apprenticeship Act was written in 1961. We only have two and a half lakh apprentices. Popcorn Stand Germany has six million, uh, 600,000 apprentices. Japan has two million apprentices. So learning by learning and learning by doing is not only an efficient way to do skill development, but it's also at the intersection of employment and employability. We need to convert employment exchanges into career centers. The matching problem is important and student aggregation is important. So our, our employ we have 1400 employment exchanges in this country. Last year to the four core people registered, they gave two lakh jobs. So they're obviously completely useless. But they have a very important role in aggregating students. So employment exchanges should become career centers which offer assessment, counseling, training, apprenticeship and jobs. We need to revamp, uh, convert our vocational training um, government system into something that has performance management. I work with an ITI in Chandigarh which has 0% um, employment and I work with an ITI in Gandhinagar which has 90% employment yet their budget is the same. There is no punishment, there is no reward. So the government skill system needs to be revamped up. We need to figure out certification and assessment. So you can be like IITs and IIMs with tight entry gates and wide open exit gates or you can be like the chartered accountant exam with wide open entry gates and tight entry exit gates, but the vocational training has wide open entry gate and wide open exit gate. <laughs> so the signaling value of certification also has to be improved. So at its heart, we have to separate financing from delivery. We have to link financing to outcomes and we have to separate prepare and prepare. I, I don't think there is no question that the government cannot accomplish this task. I mean, the private sector has a huge role. I mean, the privatization of the three E's, education, employment, and employability, is not an ideological debate. It's, an, it's, it's a physical imperative. <laughs> we have one million people joining the labor force in the next 20 years every month. How is the government has no capability, institutional capacity, or the money to train these people, to educate them, or to employ them? So the private sector is, is, a, is, a, is a given part of the solution. It's not the only solution. My, my only caution is the private sector cannot substitute for the state. And the private sector sometimes promises too much and then is held against expectations. The private sector is a part of the solution, a very important part of the solution. The government is a very important part of the solution where the market fails. But for many parts where the market works, the private sector does a much better job of government in soft infrastructure as opposed to hard infrastructure. And soft infrastructure like schools, colleges, ITIs, employment exchanges and hospitals are easy to build but hard to operate, which is why it works better in the private sector.
Well, the RTE is, is the equivalent of the MRTP Act for Education in 1975. You know, we, India had went through its reforms in 1991 and we saw a Cambrian explosion of entrepreneurial energy and companies and more people have been brought out of poverty in the last 19 years than in the 40 years before that. But in education, we, we, we don't seem to, we have not got rid of the license Raj. The Ayatollahs of education have tried to control quality by controlling quantity. We've ended up with neither. <laughs> so I think the case for the private sector is even if I don't make the case that the private sector provides better quality, I'm making the case for the private sector purely on quantity, purely on cost. So we need quantity, we need quality, and we need low cost. I think the government is, should look at itself in the mirror and say, have they delivered all the schools that India delivered? Do they deliver the learning outcomes that students want? And do they do it at the cost at which the poor can afford it? I think the answer to all three is no. So the private sector is a very important part of this uh, solution to the explosion, but the Right to Education Act actually for confiscates 25% of private school capacity. It, it, it unleashes uh, a, a corruption regime by block e education officers on private schools which will convert private schools into ATM machines. And it does nothing to sort of address the financing challenges of people who can't afford education but want to go to private schools. So in fact, what the Right to Education Act, instead of focusing on 25% of school capacities in unaided schools, it should focus on giving education vouchers or scholarships or paying for kids in unrecognized schools. So I think the Right to Education Act basically creates a birth defect <laughs> in the private sector's expansion over the next 5-10 years, if it is executed as implemented. So my, my hope is it is, uh, see in India, a bad, a, a, some acts are very bad, but they are badly implemented. <laughs> so it's a double negative. So I mean, we may not have the apocalypse that the apo uh, RTE looks on paper, but um, that's not an argument against defense. Oh, we have to, um, we have to absolutely uh, get rid of the Ayatollah regime, which is the block education officers. So the confusion, the, the clarifications, the transparency, just, just the, the codification, you know. RT is a lot of poetry. We have to think about plumbing. Yeah. So that, that's clarif the, the definitional issues, all that has to absolutely uh, go away. I think the focus on infrastructure and other things is important, but we have to have much longer time frames for all the prescriptive part like teacher ratios and playgrounds and stuff like that. What See, those are easy to measure, but they may not matter. So I think the prescriptiveness of the act has to come down a little bit. And thirdly, we have to address this 25% issue on how much will schools be reimbursed, are we asking the 75% of the parents to pay the 25%, and the transparency with which this 25% will be happening. So my, I f my belief is that at, at this moment in time, unless we can convert the 25% the into a geography-free, geography-agnostic, school-agnostic voucher program for kids across the city, it should be put on hold.